days without folks here in the building. We just, uh, we take for granted having folks here, but also glad for folks online. So I have to admit, as I've been thinking about our sermon series about promises, there seems almost like this youthfulness, this youthful nativity around the word promise. You're right, this series we're using as a placeholder for the church word covenant, which I, we don't use very much, right? We use here at church, but as adults, we have words that we use instead of promise sometimes, right? Like, you know, we make vows, contracts, oaths, guarantees, right? I solemnly swear that I'm up to no good. But somehow it feels like, you know, if we give a promise, we want it bound in something. We want it attached, something that feels solid, and of course, you know, even like a, a handshake after something, but of course, social distance makes that even the weird thing now. And so it seems as thinking about promises, there's kind of a couple different categories that promises kind of go to naturally, right? We think about promises made to us, and then we think about promises we give to others, right? Give to other people. But then there's probably a more important category as we're thinking about it, right? who keeps their promises to us and then right who doesn't keep their promises to us and i don't know is there a third alternative is there is it good enough just to say i'm trying to keep the promise <laughs> i don't know but the beauty around this idea of covenant as opposed to promise is as we talk about it especially as it relates to us in god and really, a covenant is the promise that God makes us. And while we have a response and a part to join in the covenant, and that's really kind of the broader theme we're talking through this Lent with this series, there is a part of the covenant that because it is from God, God initiates it and fulfills it. God, part of God being God is that God has us covered. God initiates the covenant and in spite of us, fulfills the covenant. And yet all of God's covenants are always better the more we participate alongside God's work. And so one of the questions I want us to think about today is how do we shape who we are to better walk alongside God and live into the fullest nature of the promises God makes? And as we look at the promises and covenants God makes in the Bible, we are shown bits of who God is and what God continues to promise us. Last week, we looked at God's promise to Noah and Noah's family, right, to never again destroy everything as God did in the flood. But more than that, right, God tells Noah and thus tells us that the purpose of a covenant is this connection that exists between God and humanity. Uh, just like that image, right, that rainbow, that there's something that connects us to God and God to us. As we get to this week's story about Abraham and Sarah, of course, in good Old Testament fashion, they were not always known as Abraham and Sarah, but originally Abram and Sarai. Our scripture reading is the part of the story where the covenant is found, and so I invite you to listen to the word of God from the book of Genesis. When Abram was 99 years old, the Lord appeared to Abram and said to him, I am El Shaddai, and that means God Almighty, God of the mountain. God said, walk with me and be trustworthy. I will make a covenant between us and I will give you many, many descendants. Abram fell on his face, and God said to him, But me, my covenant, it was with you. You will be the ancestor of many nations. And because I have made you the ancestor of many nations, your name will no longer be Abram, but Abraham. I'll make you very fertile. I will produce nations from you, and kings will come from you. I will set up my covenant with you and your descendants after you in every generation as an enduring covenant. I will be your God and your descendants, God, after you. I will give you and your descendants the land in which you are immigrants, the whole land of Canaan, as an enduring possession. 
and I will be their God. God said to Abraham, as for you, you must keep my covenant, you and your descendants in every generation. God said to Abraham, as for your wife, Sarai, she will no longer be, she will no longer call her Sarai. Her name will now be Sarah. I will bless her and even give you a son from her. I will bless her so that she will become nations and kings of people will come from her. It's the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. So I wanted to share the scripture now because right, sometimes I think people get really antsy if you're like, when is it coming? When's the scripture going to go? But I want you to kind of hold it in your minds and we're going to kind of backtrack a little in order for anything to make sense with this covenant, it kind of helps to fill in the story a little more of Abram and Sarai before this covenant moment, right? When we talked last week, everyone kind of has a general idea about Noah and the ark, but you know, not everyone is as familiar with our friends here, Abram and Sarai. This overarching story starts in Genesis chapter 12 and winds all the way through chapter 25. Uh, don't worry, I'm not gonna read that entirety, but bear with me. I'm going to give you kind of a Cliff Notes version of who they are and why we should even care. And so it all starts in that first part of chapter 12, as uh, our children's time was alluding to, God had told Abram and Sarai to go. God tells them to leave their land, leave their family. Abram was to leave his father's household and go to the place that God sh would show him. God says that God would make of Abram a great nation and bless him. And beyond that, and this is an important part from that chapter 12, is that all the families of the earth will be blessed because of you. So he takes his wife, Sarah, his nephew, Lot, and I don't know how much say Sarah and Lot got in this whole moving thing, but they go, they move, they you know, it feels like that would be a real, you know, bold, intrepid move, right? If they you know, if Abram was young, maybe if they just got married, but instead, right, Abram does all this at what age? What do you think? How old was Abram? Any guesses? A hundred, almost. Anyone? A million. Now, <laughs> one more guess. Anyone? Ninety-nine. What? One thousand wasn't quite that old. He was. He felt old, though, I'm sure. He was 75 when he started this whole journey. And that just all continues to blow my mind is how, you know, he probably thought it was the end, and then suddenly God had this new thing for him and his family. So Abram and Sarah go from there, and they have all sorts of adventures. They go to Canaan, where God tells them that this is where your land will be, where I'm going to give it to your descendants. They build an altar there, but then they keep moving, right? They go then to Egypt. Abram lies to Pharaoh that Sarah is even his wife. I'm not sure if Sarah liked that disassociation or not. Uh, then they go leave Egypt. They come back to Canaan. Lot goes off, starts living with his family away. Turns out not to be the best thing as then Lot finds himself in this like big war with a bunch of nations. He gets captured. Abram has to go rally his men to get rescue them. And then Abram has this crazy dream where God insists that Abram and Sarah will have biological descendants. They'll be part of this great legacy promised. God even has Abram look out into the sky and say, look at those stars. That will be the legacy that will be left. That will be what I will give you and your family. And through all this, right, God continues with this promise to make a great nation out of Abram. And of course, Abram and Sarah have no children. On top of that, right, they're older. They're 75 plus. Their chances of having any children, much less a nation, seem out of the question. Abram tries, you know, telling God, you know, maybe I got this head of my household. He's a great guy. Let him be my descendant. Go, let's do that. And of course, God is, is quick to say, uh, that's not gonna cut it. That's not, that's not what we're gonna do. And there's even a point, Abram and Sarah, kind of work out this arrangement. They get their Egyptian servant, Hagar, to have a son. And a, that's not either going to be what's best. As you read about all of these exploits of Abram and Sarah, I, 
I know it kind of feels like each part of these kind of like a small little episode, each one kind of is told as you read it in this kind of matter of fact way. And I'm sure, you know, this cut and dry, this happens, this happens, this happens. And it, it can kind of feel like meaningless trivia, right? If you're reading through it, I don't know how many of you are already sitting there. What does this matter, Paul? Who cares? When are you going to get to the point? But I think this is actually where it connects to us. It connects to our lives, right? We end up living in these kind of episodes. We go from day to day to day, week to week to week, month to month to month. And it's so easy to look at all these things we have done and wonder, I think just like Abram, God, what's the point? How do all these things connect? Right, we go from months of quarantine, a week full of winter storms. Now this week, where it, it, it feels like we're, it's warm and it's like a walking dream of what was before. What on earth does it mean? What purpose does God have for us through all of this? We get these vague ideas like Abram, that God wants for us to be a blessing to others. But, but how? How do we do that? How can we be a blessing when we feel like our life is this series of just episodes, almost like an endless replay of streaming content, one thing after another thing after another thing, and just like some of our apps, right, we wonder, are we still watching? Are we still listening? Are we sure we are ready for that next thing that will happen in our lives? But. It, if we dig deeper into this overarching story in Genesis, I would say both Abram and Sarah's journey near our own. I think we can find things that God is trying to work with us, just like the things we see in these stories. God is trying to work with Abraham and Sarah. The experiences of life they go through are always there, just like for us, that to, to draw, to make us better. It's just up to us, right, to figure out how do we work with them? How do we work in them? Or better put, how do we help God work these experiences to be worth something in us? How do we let God transform our experiences into meaning and purpose? For Abram and Sarai, there are these big themes that run through all the things, they, they, their adventures. One is obedience, right? If, if God tells you to go, will you go? Will you go where God leads? If you think God is telling you something, will you do it? This comes out as they continue to prepare for this nation that God promises to come through them. But I imagine they just, they felt so powerless to actually make any steps towards it. Another big theme we see is doing what's right, right? The fancy church word for this is righteousness. Are we doing and acting as God wants us to act? We see different times when Abram and Sarah treat others in foreign places, where they visit, they treat their family and friends, and they get it right on the mark. But then there's other times where it's almost like they're trying to disguise themselves, trying to act like someone they are not. And then the last theme that I see as I read through all that's going in their lives is this theme of faithfulness, right? Do we trust and go with God how do we stay and honor God when it doesn't always make sense to us? For all we know of Abram and Sarah's journey, God continues to tell them of all these plans God has for them, for the work God has that's going beyond them. But sometimes it's so hard to trust God when instead of these big sweeping plans, all we can see is just that next part of our life, right? What's next for dinner? <laughs> What part of this work I have for today can I, I got to put off till tomorrow, right? What's the best, most good thing I can do next? So perhaps you're thinking obedience, righteousness, faithfulness, these aren't the things that God is trying to work on with you in your life. But I would encourage, what is God trying to teach you? This really, I think, gets to the heart of this series and this Lenten journey that we talk about, right, as we get ready for the miracle of Easter, the miracle of resurrection in our lives. 
the things in our life have to be worth more than just passing through them. Obviously, please hear, I'm not saying that God is the one that brings us everything we experience, right? There is plenty, uh, God gives space for things. There's plenty of awful, bad, even evil things we have to go through in life. And I think God gives us space for these that we don't go through kind of these soulless automatons. But God also doesn't waste what we go through. At the very end of the, the book of Genesis, it later states, and this is in the story of Joseph, but God is in the business of producing good from bad. So how does God wanting to use what is going through in our lives to help us be and become a better person? How is God ready to shape you and shape me into being someone who can let God bless all the families of the earth through us? And that brings us to back to the covenant God makes Abraham and Sarah and also the covenant God makes with us here today. I want to go back and highlight just a, a couple verses, verse 1, 2, and 9 of what we read. When Abram was 99 years old, the Lord appeared to Abram and said to him, I am El Shaddai, walk with me and be trustworthy. I will make a covenant between us and I will give you many, many descendants. And then later in verse 9, God said to Abram, Abraham, as for you, you must keep my covenant, you and your descendants in every generation. As we wrap up our time, I want to highlight a few ways I think this covenant matters to us. I don't know if you caught it, but the very things that God had been working with Abraham and Sarah on throughout all their journeys, right? This obedience, righteousness, and faithfulness, these continue to be what God wants, right? God says, walk with me, right? That faithfulness, the do we trust and go with God says, be trustworthy, that righteousness. Are we doing and acting as God wants us to act right and justly? And then right at the end, keep my covenant. Obedience, right? We're, will we go where God leads? God wants the best out of us in order for us to be able to better be a part of the awesome plans God has for us and through us. Only through when we work on being the best we can be, can God most fully be seen in the work through us? Can God work through an unwilling vessel? Sure, right? I mean, a couple weeks ago, we, we were talking about Jonah. But there's something if we step into the flow God has. When we bring our best to God, even more incredible things can happen. We bless others best by being who God wants us to be. I don't know if you notice how old Abraham was in this part of the story, right? 99, the journey he starts at 75, he has to wait 24 years of his life. But what I love is that this is not the end of the journey, right? We, we're reading chapter 17 and there's eight more chapters of God working through him, pushing, nudging, urging Abraham and Sarah. When sometimes it feels like we're at that end, right? God has imag unimaginably more for us. And finally, the, the part that I think could probably be a whole nother sermon, God gave Abram and Sarah new names. They're to become new people. And I think these names embody that new characteristics that God wants them to live out. The way God is working in their lives led not just to the practical change, but to a systemic change. God's promise and covenants help us become new people. Right? God is ready to change us more into who God creates us to be. What ways will God work through you and us to be a blessing for others? What things do we need to work on, really, really work on with God to become who God made us to be? Maybe, maybe it's patience, right? Maybe understanding, right? Really seeing others for who they are. Perhaps it's something seemingly simple as just intentionality, being purposed in what you're about. I wish I could give each one 
your own list this time. But right, we, there's always the, the ones from our story, the obedience, righteousness, faithfulness. Those are always great challenges that God gives us. It's hard to go wrong with those. But yeah, I think God has a specific journey for each of us. God has a specific way. God wants to improve us so that we can better be a blessing to others. And the last reminder I want to leave us with is that Abraham and Sarah didn't have all the boxes checked before God would make this covenant. Remember, part of what makes a covenant with God a covenant is that God already has us covered. God's love and God's grace pushes us to the work God has for us. But right, also God's love and grace pushes us through that work that God has for us, in spite of how we might be ready for it or not, despite how ready we think we are or not, God helps us get there to more and more become who God made us to be. And of course, don't feel like this is a journey in isolation. There is still a needed place for community. Let this community, right, right here at Christ United, right here gathered, right, we, we say our table of grace, this common table of love, let this be a place where we can help each other live into who God names us to be and the good work that God continues to want us to be about to become a blessing in the lives of others. Amen.